extreme pornography, um, extreme experiences like bungee cord jumping, those set a threshold for dopamine release. I personally think that porn and the availability of porn is is a real is a real detriment to the developing brain, especially to the developing brain. In the dark corners of secrecy, Andrew Huberman exposes the forbidden truth that lingers beneath closed doors, an enigma wrapped in desire, as he dares to unravel the perplexing question, why do we still succumb to the alluring temptation of self-indulgence? We have to take a step back and now knowing what we know about testosterone and dopamine and all these things and, and ask, you know, what it, what is pornography doing to the brain? Well, first of all, it's triggering the release of dopamine and in the short term testosterone by the observation of sex, not actually engaging in human contact. A profound exploration awaits as Huberman pierces the veil of societal taboo, delving deep into the mysteries of human nature, where the primal urges of pleasure and gratification clash with the complexities of modern existence, leaving us entangled in a web of conflicting emotions. The pornography creates a strong dopamine rush. These are very primitive pathways that in some ways can overwhelm the dopamine system. And then, you know, another thing is happening. So a lot of young guys are getting all this arousal from watching other people have sex. And then they're in the real world scenario and it's like, wait, you're no longer third personing this. You're in, you're actually in this scene. <laughs> Brace yourself for a provocative revelation as Huberman uncovers the intricate dance between biology and desire, exposing the seductive allure that binds us to the age-old ritual, a primal force that transcends cultures, transcends time, and relentlessly tugs at the threads of our existence. And you think about what porn and masturbation, these things are, really are, I'm not calling them sinful. What I'm saying is they are potentially addictive, especially with the availability of pornography. So, um, you know, beware, you know, just everyone's different and, and people have to have to be careful about these circuitries. You really need to protect them. They are they are super valuable. As the curtain falls on this delicate topic, Huberman's voice resonates, a call to introspection, compassion and self-awareness, a reminder that the exploration of our deepest desires, including the enigma of self-stimulation, is an invitation to understanding, acceptance and the quest for authentic connection. There's an additional issue with pornography, which is not often discussed, which is that, remember, guys in particular, the brain is a learning prediction machine. And if, I'm not trying to say that all pornography is bad, but there are good data to support the idea that if your brain learns to be aroused by watching other people have sex, it is not necessarily gonna carry over to the ability to get aroused when you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody else. Yeah, I mean, in theory, all the things that we're talking about with pornography could be superimposed onto food or could be superimposed onto real sex, right? Um, that one also has to be cautious there, right? But the cycling back and forth between dopamine and low dopamine states, dopamine fasting as it were, but maybe just low dopamine states, these are natural rhythms that existed in the nervous system. We had to remember what the dopaminergic system is there for. I'll say it again, I wasn't consulted at the design phase, but we know as a, as a generic form of motivation and pursuit, you can imagine the human or the animal that's hungry or thirsty. It needs energy to go pursue the thing. So the idea that you have to eat in order to get energy, that's true, but you need energy in order to get the thing to eat. So our nervous system has energy also, that's dopamine and epinephrine. Yes, we use glucose and glycogen, et cetera, when we're pursuing things, but the idea here is you're pursuing something and then either by smell or by sight, you think you're on the right track. So you go down that track and then, ah, there it is. You know, you get some berries or you get, you know, let's get prehistoric about this, or you get to the prey and eat it. And then it gives you energy to continue this pursuit or to reproduce. I mean, there's a reason why humans and other animals seek out reproduction is that every, every species, but certainly humans have two innate desires built into them, whether or not they decide to actualize this or not, is the desire to protect young and make more of its own species. Every successful species does that. Even if people don't have children, in general, people care about children. But the idea here is that, you know, I'm not saying pornography as a stimulus is bad or good. What I'm saying is it, in its availability and its 
extreme forms, it's a very potent stimulus and very potent stimuli of any kind, extremely palatable food, extreme pornography, um, extreme experiences like bungee cord jumping, those set a threshold for dopamine release. And Anna will tell you that, and I'm sure she did, that the higher the dopamine peak, the bigger the drop afterwards. And it's not that you drop to baseline, you drop below baseline. So again, it's not, these things aren't good or bad. They just have to be controlled in a way because when people are pursuing dopamine peaks over and over and over and they aren't getting them, typically it's because they've been pursuing that activity far too often. I personally think that porn and the availability of porn is is a real is a real detriment to the developing brain, especially to the developing brain. Yeah. Now it sounds like you rescued the behavior, um, yeah. and it takes some discipline, right? I imagine, and it it's one of those things that um, it's also anxietyless compared to dating and relationships where people are vulnerable on both sides and have to negotiate things like you know, consent and timing and, you know, and communication and all the things that are really hard to do, but are essential to do. That's, that's key. So I think, uh, pornography is a serious issue. And because of the way that it taps into these very primitive systems, it's as serious in, in my mind as some of the other drugs of abuse, like the, the opioid crisis and I talked about cell phones. You ever notice that when you get on a phone, and you're scrolling Instagram, it's like a lot of fun. Like this stuff is cool. You're seeing people. And then sometimes you're on there and like, this doesn't feel good, but I'm doing it anyway. Yeah. I'm just doing it. That's exactly how people talk about their drug use. That's exactly how people talk about alcohol use. That's exactly how people talk about gambling. You imagine this high, but the high doesn't show up and that's you, you're dopamine depleted. You need to take some time away from it and then come back and then you can enjoy it again. Now with pornography, it's a slippery slope. Well, and there's a dark side to this too. And it's something that I think especially guys, young guys have to be careful of, which is nowadays the availability of pornography is nothing like it used to be, right? Someone used to have a magazine or a video. Now there's access to pornography is just, you know, a couple, you know, thumbtaps to, to a couple people. Uh, uh, and people uh, yeah. can get very, you know, young people can develop a lot of their arousal template yeah. to very extreme experiences right? Because of the availability of extreme porn to, and never actually have any real world experience. Yes. So if you think about it, their brains are becoming wired up to become aroused watching other people have sex. Instead of having sex themselves. Exactly. So they, they no, they're, they're, I've heard people like, oh, they need to watch porn in order to come. They, so they're having sex or even while to get watching porn. Or even to get aroused. And, yeah. and I, and it's here, clinical fetish. I have to say, you know, that I get hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of questions, different health topics yeah. and science topics. One of the most common questions I get is how to quit porn addiction. And I would say about 25% of the people that I am aware of based on those questions and a few people that I happen to know um, who are porn addicted are women. Yeah. And so, and it becomes an issue where, so there can be, so do you ask, can there become a like self conditioned Pavlovian response? Yeah. It's like, absolutely. Think about the young brain being significantly more plastic and willing to rewire than the adult brain. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's no question about it. It's hyper plastic. Yeah. And of course it can wire, rewire again, but you think about somebody who engages in a lot of um, porn watching, right? Watching porn. And that person is getting dopamine and testosterone increases by observing sex and not actually by engaging in human contact. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's concerning, right? And there, and obviously the um, people vary, but it should come as no surprise that a lot of, these people have trouble with um, romantic interactions when they do happen, right? Because they their brain isn't conditioned to respond to those, mm -hmm. right? And there's variation there, I'm sure. And, and these are private matters, so there aren't good data because there aren't laboratory experiments that you could do on this sort of thing that uh, someone will probably do those experiments eventually. But, but also dopamine seeking is what triggers the increase in testosterone. But as we just talked about it with repeated dopamine seeking or triggering of dopamine release, it starts getting diminished, diminished, diminished. So pretty yeah. soon that behavior is not causing the release of testosterone. Now people are just doing it compulsively to try and get some little droplet of dopamine out of their, out of their brain.